Keith, John, uh, do you think we can get started? Do we have? Um, yeah, it looks like Brian just uh, just logged in. OK, perfect. Morning. Morning, Brian. Mr. Chair. I'm going to be playing catch up for a moment here. All right, uh, let's go ahead and call the meeting to order. Um, item number two, uh, assuming everyone's had time to review the amended uh, agenda for today. Anybody have any questions or comments? Uh, I do have one brief item, uh, Mr. Chair, on agenda item 4B. Uh, the public notice that's listed there should actually uh, read um, from March 3rd through March 17th. We'll be posting that public notice today. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. I'll get my agenda up here. I can read it probably. There we go. Oh, maybe not. All right. Uh, mo motion to approve the agenda as noted and discussed. Mr. Chair, we also need to read the oh, COVID, COVID statement. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So I should thank Kathleen. She reminded me. So I'm going to go ahead and <laughs> read this. Uh, so as, as always, pursuant to the declared state of emergency in the Commonwealth of Virginia, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic and to protect the public health, safety of transportation, technical advisory committee members, staff, and the general public, today's meeting is being held electronically. This electronic meeting is required to complete essential business on behalf of the region. Uh, per the requirements of the Code of Virginia, the agenda, and all supporting documentation were posted on the HRTPO website for public review, and electronic copies of this information were provided to TTAC members and other interested parties. Today's meeting is being live streamed and recorded. The live stream is available for viewing on the Regional Connection YouTube channel, and the recording will be made available via the HRTPO website. The general public were provided an opportunity to comment on today's agenda in advance of the meeting via two options. Members of the public were invited to email comments to TTAC. The second option, members of the public were invited to call into a dedicated phone line where comments could be recorded for TTAC. No comments were received via either option as of 48 hours before the meeting. So as always, a few housekeeping rules for a smooth meeting. Everyone is asked to keep their phones and computers muted, except for when you're providing input. And if you do provide input, please identify yourself by name and the locality or agency you represent. And please do so the same should you provide a motion or a second. All votes today uh, taken today must be made by roll call vote and recorded in the minutes. Thanks again for your cooperation and patience, and we will record the attendance by roll call. But another additional item we just want to bring to your attention is for attendance and voting purposes. If your name is not called during the roll call and you are a voting member, an alternate voting member, or a non voting member of TTAC, please let us know, mainly to make sure that each locality of agency is correctly represented and our minutes accurately reflect the attendance. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. <clears throat> and cameras. Present. Present. Tracy Jones Schoenfeld. Present. Troy Eisenberger. Present. Carol Rizzio. Present. And Duce Ortiz. Mike Hayes. Sandin Rogers. Present. Lynn Keenan. Present. Wayne Griffin. Present. Jamie Oliver. Present. Amy Present. Ring. Present. Present. Paul Holt. Here. Tammy Rosario. Brian Stilley. Present. Angela Hopkins. Good morning, present. Angela Rico. Good morning, present. Rob Brown. Present. Ivandra Santos. Present. Debbie Mandracina. Good morning, present. Diana O'Connell. 
Garrett Fegans, Ellen Roberts, Carl Jackson, Present. James Wright, Jeff Harper, Beth Lewis, Present. Michael Johnson, Lynette Lowe, Robert Lewis, Present. LJ Hansen, Present. Jason Souders, Present. Rick Lohman, Present. Phil Pullen, Phil Pullen is here. <laughs> Thanks, Phil. David Jarman, Present. Dan G. Clayton III. Carolyn Murphy. Present. Aaron Small. Earl Anderson. Tim Cross. Here. Joseph Sisler. Sam Sink. Present. Josh Moore. Present. Grant Sparks. Present. Todd Hallisey. Present. Sonia Hallams Ponton. Eric Stringfield. Barbara Nelson. Good morning, present. Through non voting. <clears throat> Give Keith a second to catch up here. <laughs> Jason Mitchell. Present. And we have uh, Ivan Rucker. Melissa McGill. And Michael King. Here. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen, for keeping us uh, on the straight and narrow. <laughs> uh, so back to approval of the agenda uh, as amended and then uh, the one noted correction. Uh, looking for a motion to approve. Carolyn Murphy, Williamsburg, I'm motion to approve. I'll take Carolyn's motion. I believe that was Eric with the second. Yes, second. Yes. Fantastic. All right. Well, going for a consensus vote. Is any objections to the motion? Hearing none, we'll move forward. Uh, we have any submitted public comments to review? I right, thank you. Uh, moving to item number four, approval of consent items. Uh, we had the minutes of the previous meeting and one tip amendment request for turn and drive and bench search boulevard intersection improvements. Uh, do we have any discussion? Of on the consent agenda. Hearing none, can I get a motion to approve the consent agenda? To approve. Thank you, ma'am. I have a motion. Can I have a second? Carolyn Murphy, Williamsburg, second. Thank you, ma'am. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion on the motion? All right, we'll move forward with the roll call vote. Ben Cameras. Yes. Tracy Jones Schoenfeld. Yes. Troy Eisenberger. Yes. Maurizio. Yes. Mitchell. Yes. Sandon Rogers. Yes. Lynn Keenan. Yes. Wayne Griffin. Yes. Jamie Oliver. Yes. Amy Ring. Yes. Paul Holt. Yes. Brian Stilley. Yes. Angela Hopkins. Yes. Angela Rico. Yes. Rob Brown. Yes. Ivandra Santos. Yes. Debbie Mandracina. Yes. Carl Jackson. Yes. Beth Lewis. 
Yes. Robert Lewis? Yes. LJ Hansen? Yes. Jason Souders? Jason Souders. Yes. Rick Lohman? Yes. Phil Pullen? Yes. David Jarman? Yes. Carolyn Murphy? Yes. Tim Cross? Yes. Sam Sink? Yes. Josh Moore? Yes. Grant Sparks? Yes. Todd Hallisey? Yes. Sonia Hallams Ponton? Eric Stringfield? Barbara Nelson? Yes. And Sonia, I believe I saw you logged on. Okay, thank you. Fantastic. Thank you all. Uh, moving to item number five for uh, the 2045 Long Range Transportation Plan. I missed this here on the floor. Thank you very much. All right, good morning, everyone. Um, Last month, I presented the draft fiscally constrained list of projects to this committee. Um, and this committee had an opportunity to review that list. And today, um, we're looking for action uh, to recommend board approval. So you all know we're, we're getting close to the end here. Um, I can see third base. We're going to be rounding third soon in that, in that home stretch. Uh, so uh, we have several reports that we've produced to date to document our development of the 2045 Long Range Transportation Plan, and staff has produced two more draft reports uh, to assist with the review of the draft list uh, that's currently out for public review. Um, this is going to be one of the action items today is to review these two draft reports. And then as a reminder, our total forecasted revenues for the 2045 Long Range Transportation Plan, um, you can see at the table on the left, we have about $17 billion that we're reserving for maintenance uh, over the, the planning horizon for the 2045 Long Range Transportation Plan. And we have about $12.5 billion uh, to use for additional capacity improvements um, to note in the Long Range Transportation Plan. So as I presented last month, uh, staff worked very closely with the LRTP subcommittee to develop the draft fiscally constrained list of projects. Again, that, that list identifies 12 and a half billion in regional multimodal transportation investments. But we did present the draft list to the board at its February uh, meeting last month. Um, we have been uh, coordinating uh, with regional stakeholders for the review. Again, TTAC had the opportunity um, we, we did receive one request, which was from the city of Hampton, which we'll discuss uh, further later in this presentation. We also presented to the FTAC, um, so they, they're having an opportunity to review the list. We've sent the list out to the Community Advisory Committee, and I will be presenting to them next week. Um, also to the Active Transportation Subcommittee. And then we initiated the public review after the board meeting last month. Um, and that's a 30 day public review. Uh, so, so that is still ongoing until March 19th. So then just a reminder um, in terms of demonstrating fiscal constraint, again, we have that 12 and a, 12 and a half billion um, that's available for additional capacity. And when we add up all the projects that we're recommending for the 2045 long range transportation plan, we are under uh, that amount. Uh, so we have demonstrated fiscal constraint. And then this is just a map and a summary of the all the multimodal projects in the plan. Uh, we've got nine bridge or tunnel projects, uh, 11 interstate uh, highway or interchange projects. And we've got 75 other non-interstate highway or interchange projects. 20 of those are locally, regionally significant, locally funded projects located within Virginia Beach. Four intermodal uh, freight projects. We have three regional roadway studies four regional transit projects, three regional transit studies, and 27 active transportation projects. Um, and this is just, again, a summary of, of the outreach that's ongoing. Um, again, that 30-day that public review uh, to assist with, with the outreach and the review of the list. Uh, we have made available um, our draft project information guide. 
which includes a one-page summary of each project uh, that's on the draft list. We've also created an interactive uh, online map um, that's up on our website, so anyone that wants to zoom into a particular project has that resource as well. In terms of modifications from what I showed you last month, um, we are uh, recommending that we remove the 22nd Street Bridge in Chesapeake, uh, remove that from the draft list because that project is complete and open, uh, so we don't, don't need to list it on the fiscally constrained list. If there are any other projects uh, that also fall under this, this same, if, if the project's already done and open to the public, just shoot me an email um, so I'm aware of that before we present the draft list uh, to the board later this month. In terms of potential modifications, uh, we did receive a request from the city of Hampton um, to add three projects. Uh, they sent a letter in uh, to our executive director. You can see on this slide of what those three projects are. It includes Coliseum Drive Extension B with an estimated year of expenditure cost of 15.4 million. And then two interchange studies uh, along 64, uh, one at North King Street and one at LaSalle Avenue those interchange studies would be about a million dollars each. Um, and looking at what we have available um, for the LRTP for these particular um, types of projects, we do have about 20 million available to constrain uh, additional projects um, in the 2045 long range transportation plan. So I'm gonna pause here. Uh, I'd like to um, allow the city of Hampton staff an opportunity uh, to talk about their request and then ask uh, TTAC um, for some discussion on this item. So, so thank, thank you, Dale. Um, this is Jay Simmons with the city of Hampton. Um, and, and Chairman Stilley, I'll, I'll start with Coliseum B. Um, we're, we're requesting uh, consideration for the 2045 long, long range transportation plan as Coliseum B is critical for our Langley Air Force Base, NASA Research Center, uh, and it's, it's essentially called our Joint Base Langley uh, Eustace Effort. Um, as, as you may know, uh, Langley Air Force Base is bringing a new squad, fighter squadron of F-22s to Hampton Roads, uh, and they'll be based at Langley. Um, we, we currently have requests from Langley Air Force Base to relocate Armstead Avenue, um, which essentially will be the new thoroughfare for Coliseum B. Uh, essentially, the runway where these, uh, these billion dollar aircraft land, uh, it has, has some flooding issues on the, on the water end. Um, and they're and they're currently worried about um, a, a long term effects of that. So essentially, they want to close Armstead Avenue uh, and create a Coliseum B for that that main travel thorough. And we are already in progress with Coliseum A. So that project is being constructed as we speak. Uh, again, we have we have support from Langley Air Force Base, uh, but both of the current and former commanders. Um, JBLE is extending uh, the runway rest again for all of those seaward and flooding issues that I discussed. And again, uh, we really, we'd really like to move forward and try to get some funding in our smart scale round five. So we'd really like support of the group uh, to move that forward. And then the, the two smaller um, requests was essentially a uh, million dollars for each of the studies for the King Street interchange and the LaSalle. Uh, Avenue Interstrange, as you know, uh, with the modifications or improvements to the Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel, um, it, it's going to it's going to increase traffic here, traffic flow here, and we really don't have a main thoroughfare to get customers off of the interstate into our downtown Hampton area, which is is developing. Uh, so that's that's just a snapshot of really what we're requesting um, from the team. Dale. Dale, this is Lynn from Hampton. If I could jump in and just add a little bit more to that. Um, so to Jason's point, we are working um, with Langley. And so just to make that a little bit more clear, because of both sea level rise and flooding, the goal is that Langley needs to extend the runway. And so they would be extending the boundaries of the base and that extension of the runway would would move it outside of the existing fence line and would encumber Armstead Avenue. So we'd actually have to close Armstead and relocate that north south connection to Coliseum. So we have the first portion of that under Coliseum A, which has already been funded. And this would be the second phase of that to make a full north south connection. Um, 
And so that's what we're really looking for. We've worked with VDOT. Um, it was an unsuccessful application in this round of smart scale, but we're looking to resubmit that for next time. And we just want to uh, make sure that it's included in the LRTP so that it'll be more successful um, in the next round. And we're looking to, to retool that with both Langley input um, as well as VDOT improve that score. We also wanted to just note, and, and I apologize on behalf of the city, I'm very new still. Um, we we should have come back earlier and asked to have some of the scores uh, reviewed. And since we got the draft, we've I've been working with Dale to look at some of these. Um, and I think when we looked at the criticality of the installation, um, and Dale, if you can speak to this probably much more, um, more eloquently than I can, but um, but I think that we saw, and we're not asking to have that actually included within here, but that the scores would have been higher had we um, had those scores we looked at to include the criticality of the, the Langley project. So the Coliseum B is just something that we would really like to have included within, and we ask that TTAC just give us a little bit of grace. Um, we have some growing pains with new staff. Um, we have a lot of people involved in this process that weren't involved last time. So I apologize that this is last minute, um, but. Everyone can just give us a little, a little grace, um, and we're here to answer any questions that anybody has for that. And then I, I can speak uh, quickly to the, the reference Lynn made um, with the prioritization score. Um, having this new information, uh, unofficially, I went back and, and saw, looked at the score. I think the project score is uh, 96 or 98 right now. And if I were to tweak levers based on that, just the Lang Langley references, that this project would now provide uh, the access to Langley high unemployment and would become a regional project since it's, it's, it is providing that access to Langley. Just those three uh, tweaks in, in the tool would increase the score by about 30 points. I, I think it would increase it to about 120. Again, that's unofficial um, because you know we've already had these approved scores. So, but but um, working with Lynn, uh, we did look at that for the project. Well, well, thank you, Jason, Lynn, and, and Dale for the information. Do you have any uh, questions from the floor? All right, hearing none, uh, Dale, let's continue on. All right, thank you. Okay, so before we get to the recommended action, just a reminder slide of, of our actions that, that we still have to take care of before we can adopt the 2045 long range transportation plan. Again, we have this draft fiscally constrained list out for review until March 19th. We will be presenting the list to the board uh, later this month. There is a special board meeting um, scheduled for March 29th. Um, I believe at 1030, Pavitha, correct me if I'm wrong on that. Yeah, yeah. 1030 to 12. Thank you. Um, and in terms of remaining steps, uh, once the board approves um, fiscal constraint of the of the list and the plan, then we're going to turn around at the April TTAC meeting and hold an ICG uh, conformity um, agenda item so we can actually initiate that transportation air quality conformity process, which is again about a three month process. And then while conformity uh, is being assessed, um, then we're going to complete documentation of the 2045. Uh, we have uh, two or three more reports uh, that we'll put out in terms of plan performance and public outreach documentation. And then looking to have board approval uh, this summer, aiming for June, um, but with the board schedule, we might actually have to wait till July, uh, which is fine. Our, our 2040 actually expires July 21st, uh, 2021. So in terms of recommended actions, uh, what we're asking TTAC today is to recommend a TPO board approval of the 2045 long range transportation plan, fiscally constrained list of projects uh, modified as uh, I presented today. So that would be to remove uh, the 22nd street bridge and then based on uh, TTAX recommendation, uh, consider Hampton's request as well. Um, and then if, if whoever makes that motion, and if there's more discussion, we need clarity uh, on what we're actually approving for that list of projects. And then also we're asking TTAC to review the two draft reports, the funding plan and the project information guide, and to provide any comments to me by March 16th. So that concludes my formal presentations. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, ma'am. I have 
questions from the comments from the floor. Oh, yes, Mr. Chair, this is uh, Carl in Portsmouth. Uh, just a question uh, for Dale. Uh, if we were to accept the uh, Hampton modification, could we still demonstrate uh, fiscal constraint in the plan? Yes, great question, Carl. Um, we do have about 20 million available for these types of projects. Uh, so Hampton's request is uh, just under 18 million, so we would still be fiscally constrained. Okay, all right, great. Um, well, I'll, I'll make the motion then to uh, to approve the, the modification to improve the uh, fiscally constrained plan. Thank you, Carl. Uh, can you turn your microphone up a little bit? Oh, for me? Okay. Yeah. Can you hear me any better? Fantastic. It's coming through like a whisper before. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll motion to uh, for, uh, to make the modification and to uh, to approve the uh, fiscally constrained plan. Thanks, sir. I have a motion on the floor. Do I have a second? Sam Sink, HRT, second. Thank you, ma'am. I have a motion to second. Do I have any discussion on the motion on the floor? Hearing none, we'll move forward to the roll call vote. Ben Cameras? Yes. Tracy Jones Schoenfeld? Yes. Troy Eisenberger? Yes. Carol Rizzio? Yes. Jason Mitchell? Yes. Sandon Rogers? Yes. Lynn Keenan? Yes. Wayne Griffin? Yes. Jamie Oliver? Yes. Amy Ring? Yes. yes. Paul Holt? Yes. Brian Stilley? Yes. Angela Hopkins? Yes. Angela Rico? Yes. Rob Brown? Yes. Ivandra Santos? Yes. Debbie Mandracina? Yes. Uh, Carl Jackson. Yes. Beth Lewis. Yes. Robert Lewis. Yes. L.J. Hansen. Jason Souders. <laughs> Rick Lohman. Yes. Phil Pullen. Yes. yes. David Jarman. Carolyn Murphy. Tim Cross. Yes. Sam Sink. Yes. Josh Moore. Yes. Grant Sparks. Todd Hallisey. Yes. Sonia Hallams Ponton. Eric Stringfield. Yes. Barbara Nelson. Yes. It was Carolyn Murphy, yes. Okay, thank you. And uh, LJ? Sorry, yes. Thank you. And I think we had one more down here, Keith. Um, uh, Grant Sparks? Okay, and Sonia Hallows Ponton. I would thank you all. Thanks all to the uh, hard work of the staff and the LRTP subcommittee for grinding out. It's been a uh, extraordinarily fast paced plan development and, uh, and getting us to where we are now. All right, moving on to item number six, Bowers Hill Interchange Study. Uh, Mr. Smizek, floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. Another opportunity to update HRTPO on where we are with the Bowers Hill Environmental Impact Statement, or EIS. Next slide, please. Uh, 
Um, for those of you who are not familiar, in 2019, VDOT and Federal Highway issued an environmental assessment, or EA, that focused solely on improvements to the Bowers Hill interchange. Um, during the public review of that document in 2019 and in early 2020, um, a few changes occurred that affected that study. One, um, the region and VDOT begin, began to advance plans for the Hampton Roads Express Lane Network, which would come right up alongside the Bowers Hill Interchange. And then HRTPO also took action to exp expand the Bowers Hill Interchange study, study area, extending it north uh, along I-664 to the College Drive Interchange. Um, so based on those changes and previous studies that have been done along this corridor, um, VDOT entered into discussions with Federal Highway about the expanded scope and the transition from an EA to an environmental impact statement. Uh, the effort on that EIS began in August of 2020. You'll note on the slide we refer to it as pre-NEPA efforts. Um, an EIS does not officially begin until a notice of intent is issued by the Federal Highway Administration. And we'll get into that a little bit later. But since August 2020, we've been holding monthly agency meetings uh, in which HRTPO, HR TAC, and the surrounding localities are a part of, uh, along with state and federal regulatory agencies. And those meetings are used to advance the study process that we'll get into in a little bit here as well. Next slide, please. Excellent. So since we began in 2020, one of the first steps was to inform the public about the change in study parameters. Um, that was done through updates to the study website. And then we've also had mailings going out notifying property of our activity in the corridor. Uh, we've set up a mailing list online where folks can come to the website and sign up for our mailing list, and when they do so, they get a monthly email that mid-month every month that provides some status on where we are and upcoming activities to get involved. Um, since that study changed, we've also been out in the field. This is a much larger corridor that requires additional collection of data, primarily focused on natural resources, wetlands and streams, but also looking for historic structures and just documenting community resources. We held a public survey in September and October of 2020 to inform the development of a purpose and need statement, which I'll get to in a minute. But that was the first real opportunity for the public to get involved in this larger EIS study. And based on the input from that survey, the federal agencies concurred on the purpose and need in December of 2020. Um, as I mentioned, this is all done through our monthly meetings, and we will continue to hold those meetings um, throughout the course of the EIS study. We're also providing routine briefings to the HRTPO Bowers Hill Working Group and other interested parties as needed. Next slide, please. So as this one comes up, as I mentioned, we had a public survey to inform the development of the purpose and need. Given the COVID world we live in today, that survey was done entirely online through the website and through social media posts and our mailing list. Nearly, nearly 1,300 public comments we received is a record for a VDOT study at this stage. Next slide, please. So I've been speaking about the purpose and need. What you see on the slide now is the purpose and need statement for the Bowers Hill Interchange EIS study. The purpose and need sets the goals for the study and serves as the primary criteria in the alternative screening process. So the bullets you okay. see on the slide in front of you represent the goals for the study and what the potential alternatives that we'll get into in a few minutes will be measured against. Next slide, please. Uh, 
Looks so we have an additional public outreach and comment effort that's going on right now. Um, beginning on February 12th, we posted a number of different pieces of information on the study website related to the options that are currently under consideration. So folks can go online now. We have what would look like your traditional boards at an in-person public meeting. Uh, we have FAQ documents and downloadable pamphlets. And then on March 15th, it's what we'll actually call our citizen comment opportunity. We'll post a narrated presentation where folks can log on at their convenience and have a narrated presentation of all that material. Um, we'll conclude the public comment period on March 25th. And what we're looking for here is people's reaction to the different options that are on the table right now, which we'll get into here in a few minutes. Um, one of the unique steps for this study is we are enhancing our outreach to environmental justice communities, um, working with the VDOT Hampton Roads District Public Affairs Office. Uh, we've identified over 100 individuals, groups, um, organizations, or locations in which we feel the EJ community can be reached, and we've had special mailings and outreach to those groups um, to make sure they're aware and are able to participate in this citizen comment opportunity. The CCO may be a new acronym or term for folks, and that's just our way of speaking to a all virtual opportunity. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, we have a, a range of concepts that are on the table right now. <clears throat> um, at this stage in the study, it is not our goal, nor is it desirable to identify the alternative that's going to advance. Or, or even to say this is the group at this point, we're sure we have an appropriate range of options on the table. Um, so what we're looking at so far and what's being presented to the public include adding one general purpose lane in each direction on 664. Adding two general purpose lanes in each direction on 664. Adding an express lane plus a drivable shoulder to 664. And I'll, I'll pause there because this is an interesting one and highlights the great um, communication and participation we've had with HTPO to date. Um, when we initially drew up this range of options, we did not consider drivable shoulders. That's not always something you think about in NEPA, but working with the TPO working group, um, it's brought to our attention that you know, having this option be an express lane plus a drivable shoulder would be more consistent with the Hampton Roads express lane network system that's coming online now. Um, so we were able to modify that option, had no objection from any of the agencies involved. So this is what the public is seeing today. Um, and also when we speak of drivable shoulder, we are assuming in NEPA that that drivable shoulder would be part of the express lane system. So moving on, the final mainline option, if you will, would be to add two express lanes in each direction on 664. Some of the other options include collector distributor lanes or CD lanes, uh, major interchanges along 664. We also are looking at a transportation system management and travel demand management or TSM TDM option. And again, this is an area where we've had some great uh, conversation with the TPO working group and our agency group. Um, if you're familiar with our larger studies in the past, I think TSM TDM we make note of it. We, we make clear that as a standalone option, it would not meet the purpose of need and we kind of set it aside. I think through this study, we're, we're giving TSM and TDM a bigger look, taking a deeper dive into it. We are to be informed by another VDOT study that's going on right now. There's a planning study that TMPD is conducting, looking at all of 64 and 664. And that study has been able to identify TSM, TDM improvements that could be implemented within our study area. So we're bringing some real information to this study and would look to TPO board, HR tax board, and eventually CTB to determine if and how TSM, TDM may be applied to an alternative in this study. And then finally, we have an option that would consider transit only improvements. Um, we've worked very closely with the 
AT to get their input on what transit only would look like in our study. DRPT has confirmed that there is no need for transit only lanes to be considered. So when we talk about transit only improvements, we're talking about physical improvements that can be made to our study area to enhance transit. Um, I'd also note that all of these mainline options, so any of the add general purpose or add express lane options come with improvements to the Bowersill interchange. Um, for those of you who are familiar with the EA study, they looked at different options that included braided ramps or full reconstruction of the interchange, and we'll be looking at similar options as part of this study. But those options could need to consider how express lanes would pass through that interchange if those options advance. So again, this is what we're looking for input from the public right now. Welcome comments or questions at the end of this presentation as well. If HRTPO or the localities want to make comments during this comment period, that's more than welcome. Um, we'll bring all those public comments back to the agencies for concurrence um, later this spring, and I'll get to that in a few more slides. Next slide, please. So the next few we can flip through, but this is just for your information, um, just some general typical sections that we're using right now for planning purposes. These are illustrative. Um, there is no commitment right now being made to widen to the inside or outside, and you can flip through these as I talk. Um, but as you flip through these, you'll see we're experimenting with widening to the inside or outside. We wouldn't look to make that decision at least until we've concurred on a range of alternatives. At that point, we can begin to spend our resources to dive a little deeper into advancing engineering of the alternatives that have advanced. And that would be our opportunity perhaps to decide if we're gonna widen inside or out. Um, but such a decision may also not be made in NEPA and could be deferred to more detailed design phases that would follow NEPA and occur before construction. So next slide, please. So I've talked a lot about or hinted a lot about different, you know, different steps in the process. So this slide is meant to illustrate our path forward. Uh, we are currently at the range of concepts. We hope to gain concurrence from our agency partners on that range of concepts in May of this year. So that would be concurrence on which alternatives are going to advance for study and which are not. Uh, we'll spend the rest of 2021 running our alternatives and assessing impacts. As I mentioned earlier, the NEPA study itself does not officially begin until Federal Highway issues a notice of intent. Based on the new Council on Environmental Qualities regulations for implementing NEPA, Federal Highway cannot issue intent until the range of alternatives is known. So that's kind of a TBD for us right now. Assuming we get concurrence in May, we would look for Federal Highway to issue their notice of intent in May or June, which would officially start the study and the two year time frame in which we need to complete the study uh, to meet federal expectations. So as I mentioned, we'll spend the rest of this year assessing impacts, refining alternatives in early 2022. We would return to the public uh, with the results of our study and make a recommendation for a preferred alternative. We would look for action from HRTPO's board, HR tax board, and any of the surrounding localities that chose to take an action. All of that would be presented to our agency group for concurrence on a recommended range of alternatives, or I'm sorry, on a recommended preferred alternative which then would be presented to CTB in early 2022 for action. With CTB action, we would look to publish our draft EIS in what I like to call late spring 2022. Um, and under current NEPA regulations, we also expect to need to obtain federal permits as part of the NEPA process. So you see joint permit application in spring of 2022. It is necessary for us to obtain an Army Corps of Engineers permit as part of this process. So once CTB acts and identifies the preferred, we'll begin that permit process as well. Uh, with the end goal of 
early 2023, Federal Highway will issue a combined final EIS and record of decision, which is something new for VDOT and Virginia Federal Highway. Uh, usually we issue a final EIS and then a record of decision, but this is another one of those new NEPA topics that we're trying to get up to speed with. And we would expect almost at the same time to obtain whatever federal authorizations or permits are necessary. So early 2023, NEPA complete with permits in hand. Please. So I know I've blown through this pretty quickly as I tend to do, but I appreciate the opportunity to come present this information to you all. Um, thank you for your time and welcome any questions or comments you might have. Thank you, Scott. Have questions from the floor? Uh, Mr. Chair, this is uh, Carl from Portsmouth. Uh, yes, sir. Hi. Yes, uh, hi, Scott. I appreciate you including uh, the uh, TDM, uh, TSM uh, as one of the concepts. Uh, we just wanted to be sure, uh, regardless of uh, whatever uh, mainline improvements you make to 664, will there always be uh, TDM under consideration you know, uh, within the corridor? Um, so, I mean, that, that's a decision that I would look to the boards to make. Will TSM and TDM be applied to a preferred alternative? In other words, will there be a commitment that coming out of this NEPA study, along with the mainline improvements, there will be TSM, TDM? I mean, that's one option. That's not necessary for that to happen. We could complete NEPA and just stay focused on the mainline corridor, HRTPO, HRTAC, CTB, over the course of the next few years, could identify other TSM, TDM projects that while they're independent of this may be delivered as the overall construction package that comes years down the line. Um, so I guess to summarize, you know, it, it could be part of the study. It could not, but it doesn't preclude it either way. Okay, thank you. Yeah, just realizing the best way to reduce congestion in this corridor is to, you know, get people out of their vehicles. So, you know, it would be good if we could, uh, you know, maintain that. But uh, I understand what you're saying. Any other questions from the floor? Uh, Mr. Chair, I uh, just wanted to kind of put it out there that the VDOT is continuing to provide updates at our monthly Bowers Hill working group meeting. So we just had one last week, I believe, and we'll continue to have those meetings. And that's what VDOT mentioned at, the, at their last meeting. So just want everyone to have it on your radar so, so that we all will be able to engage on this process. So. I believe this meeting is only on Friday mornings. Yeah, usually on Friday mornings at 9.30. Showing up on the uh, TPO calendar, so more than merry. All right, anything else this item? This is Cole Fisher from the City of Virginia Beach. Yes, sir. Um, with this interchange study, um, will there be a need to recalculate any traffic projections um, in correlation with the regional connector study? The question. The study we use a travel demand model, uh, the HRTPO's travel demand model, to conduct all our traffic analyses. So we're basing that off of the current long range plan right now. Understanding, as we just heard, uh, TPO is working on producing their new long range plan, which assume a new travel demand model. So I. The draft EIS will be informed by the current plan, but if it was deemed warranted or requested as part of the final EIS and assuming the new long range plan is out and the model is ready to go, we could run additional traffic through the future model as part of the final EIS. Thanks, Scott. Last call for questions, comments. All right, hearing none, we'll move on to uh, item number seven. And Mr. House is here to talk about everybody's favorite activity, funding. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, 
Hopefully you can hear me okay. Can you hear me? Just want to make sure. If you could uh, talk a little louder, that would help. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. How, is that better? Yep. Great, great. Good morning. Uh, Mr. Chair, if you don't, if you don't have any objection, I, I would ask if anybody has questions as we go through the presentation, um, please feel free to go ahead and interrupt and ask. Um, I, I did want to provide an update to everyone for the uh, Smart Scale Round 4. And uh, ho hopefully um, you all have been getting some notifications from, from our office and from the system, but just wanted to go through and see if anybody had any questions and give you the latest information as was uh, presented to the CTB um, last month and our next steps. Um, next slide, please. Um, hopefully you all have already seen this. This was our, our schedule for the round four smart scale um, process. Um, we, for the most part, followed the schedule as, as proposed. Um, there were some slight changes due to COVID-19, but um, I, I can tell you that we're back on track and the remaining schedule, which I'll talk about at the end of the presentation, um, we'll be following. I did first wanna thank everyone for everybody's support and flexibility as we went through this round. Four, um, process. I know it was very challenging with COVID-19, and I, I do think we have another successful round um, completed or almost complete, near completion. And I just want to thank everybody for your continued support, um, you know, through this challenging time. Um, next slide. So just a quick timeline to date. These are some of the major activities that we conducted um, up to this point. You see we had the the deadline for submitting project applications was August 17th. Um, it was supposed to be a little bit earlier in August, but that's looked out to the 17th. Um, since that point, we've been screening and evaluating projects. Back on January 19th, the um, recommended scenario was presented to the Commonwealth Transportation Board. And the final bullet there you'll see says that in February 17th, there was a correction to the recommended scenario that was presented to the CTB. Um, and I'll talk a lot about a lot more about that as we get near the end of the presentation, um, but did want to address that today. Next slide, please. So just summary, we had 406 applications statewide that were submitted for this round. Um, after um, seven projects screened out and two applications withdrawn, there were 397 applications that were scored for round four. So statewide ask, um, there was $6.3 billion requested under Smart Scale, with total project cost of about $7.8 billion. So looking at Hampton Roads, we had 53 applications that were submitted for scoring, um, which equated to about $762 million of Smart Scale requests, and uh, total project cost of about $833.4 million. Next slide. So as a reminder, the, the two different funding programs um, to fund smart scale projects is the high priority project program. And those projects actually compete on a statewide basis. And for round four, we had about $490 million available under high priority. And for the district grant program, that, that's the uh, program where projects compete within each district. And uh, for that program statewide, we had $883 million available under district grant. Next slide. I'm sure you all are, are familiar with this, but just thought I'd include it as a reminder. Um, the smart scale measures and scoring is based on four different um, weighting type of typologies. Um, and uh, you see for Hampton Roads, are we have two different categories. We have urban category A and rural category D. Most of our district is in urban category A, which uh, the, the six different factor areas, the, the major weighted one for that category is 45% um, is the congestion mitigation. Um, for the Eastern Shore and some of the um, Western part of our district, they do fall under rural category D. And you see for, for those, um, this, uh, localities, you see where it's um, safety at 30% and economic development at 35% are the two major weighting factors for that category. 
So again, I just wanted to include this here again, just as a reminder. Um, so we do use these six factor areas and, and coming up with the actual score uh, for the smart scale applications. I'm using these various categories. And next slide. This is the recommended scenario that was presented to the Commonwealth Transportation Board back on January 19th. Um, of the 53 projects, we have 19 that were recommended for funding. Uh, those are listed here. Um, and uh, localities have been notified that, the, that their projects had scored. And uh, again, we had presented this in, in January, and I do have an update to this, but just want to go through some of the details um, on these projects in the next few slides. So next slide, please. So this is just the um, summary chart of the recommended scenario. Um, have listed all nine districts. I highlighted our district to show how the 19 projects were broken down. So um, you know, once the projects are scored, we have a three-step process in actually applying the, the district grant and high priority funding to the projects. So the uh, first step, as is shown here, uh, we fund the top scores that are eligible for district grant program funds. So for this round, we had 15 projects that received $118 million. Then we moved on to step two. To um, We funded the next top two projects that would have otherwise been funded with available district grant funds, but were not because they were only eligible for high priority. So we did have two projects in Hampton Roads that equated about $1.2 million for those. And then the step three, we scored the projects that were eligible for high priority funds and, uh, and, and, rate, and uh, funded the top priorities in that category. And you see we had two projects that equated to about $28.6 million. So in all of the 53 projects that were submitted, we did have 19 that were recommended for funding which equated to about $148.5 million. Um, and we do have about 1.3 million that was remaining for district grant. Next slide, please. This here is just a summary slide that kind of breaks down the number of applications that were submitted by locality, the uh, total project cost and the um, smart scale dollar request. Um, we, we kind of broke it down to see what projects in this round were successful. And what we found, there were about 15 projects that were funded um, that had requests less than $10 million. So $10 million seemed to be the sweet spot as far as the, the smart scale request. Um, also, at the, the bottom chart there, you see we broke it down by bike, pedestrian, bus, transit, highway, and TDM. And uh, we showed the number of projects that were submitted and the, the number funded and the percent funded. So you see in that chart, we had 100% funding for the bus transit projects that were submitted and 100% for the um, TDM projects. Um, the, the highway projects, we were about 28% of those requested were funded and bike and pedestrian is about 27%. Next slide, please. Oh, can you can you back? I think you want one for. Can you back up one? I'm sorry. Oh, I must have taken that out. Okay. <laughs> Next slide, please. All right. So in the in the uh, timeline slide I showed, I said the last bullet. I said that we had a, a new recommended scenario that was presented to the Commonwealth Transportation Board on February 17th. Um, that was to, due to a, a QAC, QAQC process that was done, um, and there was an error identified in the Environmental, Natural, and Cultural Resource Measure, the E2 measure. And uh, basically, that measure was not calculated in a manner consistent with what was already approved by the uh, Commonwealth Transportation Board as presented in 2019, where the board adopted changes to make sure, uh, make measure subtractive. So tracking up to five points based on the total environmental sensitive area uh, within a quarter mile of, of the project, which is different than what we did in the previous three rounds. The, uh, the Office of Intermodal Planning and Investment did provide a detailed presentation on this area at the uh, February 17th meeting. 
Um, I didn't want to go into too much detail today on that because they did a pretty good job going through the details and, and due to time, I, I just wanted to mention that that, that was um, readjusted, that environmental uh, measure and the projects were rescored. Next slide, please. And based on the rescoring, what you'll see on the, on the table on the left, there were two projects in Hampton Roads that were removed from the initial staff recommendation that was presented in January. Um, so in Hampton Roads, we had um, Newport News and James City County had projects that fell off based on the new revised scoring. Um, we did, and the, the graph on the right shows the projects that were added based on the new environmental measure. Um, and we had two projects that were added. Um, Chesapeake and, and Suffolk Transit actually had projects that were added to the recommended scenario. Next slide. So what I included here is, is a graphic, a table showing the modified recommended scenario that was presented to the CTB back in February. The um, 19 projects you see there highlighted, those are the projects that are being recommended for funding. Um, I did include all of the other school, all of the other projects in ranking. Um, based then, I did show in the right two columns, you'll see the new rank and old rank. Um, that's based on the new measure that I mentioned. Um, so I did include that for all 53 projects. Uh, the next um, two slides show that. Also here, I did include the district grant and high priority grant funding to show how the projects were funded. I, I did want to point out, if you look at uh, project number 19 is the I-64 Denby Boulevard interchange project. You'll see that that project is being funded with $46.5 million with high priority funds. That is a change from what was presented in January. In January, that project was going to be funded with district grant money. Next slide. And I'll talk about that here in a second of why. Um, so th this is, again, I, I included all of the different projects ranked up to the total 53 that were actually provided. Next slide, please. And one more, please. So I updated the, the summary chart that I presented previously uh, for, and included all nine districts, including Hampton Roads. So what you see now, is, is based on the new funding scenario, based on the new scores. So under step one, we have 15 projects that were scored using district grant at about 75 million. Step mm -hmm. two, high priority, we had two projects at the 1.2 million. And then under step three, we had two projects at 49 million, which included the I-64 Denby project. So if you go to the far right, you see the remaining balance is about $45 million. So we do have a balance of funding, and we're currently working with our CTB members to um, fund additional projects that are in the, in the uh, program or being requested. So we haven't had those meetings yet, um, and I'll talk a little bit about timeline here, but the good news is uh, we did end up getting about $45 million of district grant funding freed up for us to apply to additional projects. Next slide. So here, here's the next steps. Um, so we're meeting with our CTB members and they're developing any potential revisions to the scenario. Um, we will be holding uh, virtual public hearings. It sounds like it's gonna be late April, early May timeframe. There will be nine public hearings across the state, one for each of our VDOT districts. Um, we'll have more information on that as far as date, exact date and timing of those public hearings. But uh, we will be presenting the, the, the funding scenario for a smart scale and the FY22 to 27 six year improvement program. Uh, we do plan on having the draft um, reviewed and, and available for those public hearings. And that draft will be presented to the Commonwealth Transportation Board at their May 18th meeting with the final program adopting not only smart scale projects, but other projects being added to the six year plan um, in June at their June 23rd CTB meeting. And then, of course, we'll be uh, starting with round five. I don't have on here, but I did want to mention that we will be reaching out to each of you and that we're involved with the smart scale round four process and, and asking for lessons learned, best practices, anything that we can learn from the previous round that we can apply to round five. So 
So there will be additional conversations on that, but we would, we would like to have your feedback. Next slide. What I included here is just some links. Um, all the information I went over today is available on um, the VDOT's public website, also on the Commonwealth Transportation website. So I just included, if you're, you're curious, we have the detailed scorecards for each project that shows how they scored in the different uh, categories. Um, we also have the, the spreadsheets that I shared today showing the new funding scenario. Um, I did have a, uh, some additional updates, but before I move off of smart scale, I'd want to ask if there's any questions from the group. Todd, this is LJ. Yes, sir. Hi, LJ. Uh, the the additional forty five million as a as a result of the the shift to the district grant. Um, when do you think that there'll be a funding uh, allocation made for that forty five? Um, we're meeting with our Commonwealth Transportation Board members um, late next week. Um, we, we hope to get their recommendations on how to apply that funding uh, following that meeting with them and uh, should have the revised um, list um, showing the additional projects shortly thereafter. So it, it is okay. something that we hope to be able to share with folks within the next few weeks. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you, Todd. You're welcome. Any other questions? If not, uh, Mr. Chair, I do have one more slide. Um, next slide, please. And this is just, uh, I wanted, wanted to share other items of interest um, real quick. Just wanted to go over some of the uh, upcoming call for applications and other uh, meetings that we have planned. Um, I did include revenue sharing. Um, these are tentative dates. We're still trying to finalize, um, but we do have an applicant workshop for the next round of revenue sharing. Um, that applicant workshop is planned for April 29th. We also will have a pre-application um, for, for the revenue sharing program, which will open on May 17th, close on July 2nd, and then um, the full application period will, will begin with the final applications being due October 1st at 5 p.m. I do want to point out that as of right now, we've heard uh, similar to what we experienced with this round of revenue sharing projects, um, the, mon the money being programmed will be for the last two years of the six-year plan. So for the upcoming revenue sharing program, it will be for allocating funds in FY 27 and 28. Um, we, we have also on here the transportation alternatives program tentative dates. Um, it's exactly the same for pre-application and full application deadline um, as the revenue sharing. The, um, we will have an application workshop on uh, April 14th. And, and that program will be for the FY23 and 24 allocations. Um, I wanted to mention some meetings that we, we have uh, that we're planning. Um, we, we are planning to hold a inaugural regional planning summit. Um, we're working with TPO folks and hope to have something, uh, a date uh, meeting, a summit with, with all of our um, local transportation planners and TPO. Um, where we have an opportunity, you know, to come together, talk about the project pipeline process and how we can uh, continue to work together, you know, connecting VTRANS, um, the long range plan, local priorities to identify good candidates for smart scale and, and other funding types. So we're working on, on getting that scheduled uh, with a TPO, but of course, with the long range plan being the big push right now, um, we, we don't want to take away from that, knowing that's a heavy lift. So. Uh, There'll be more to come on the summit, um, including the, the exact time date um, uh, here in the near future. Uh, we all also, also plan to have our Hampton Roads District Spring Local Workshop, what we call the Lap Circle with local governments. Um, the last, except for uh, last year where we had it virtually, we've had these, this meeting, day long training, um, and, and uh, cooperation with our localities, and uh, we are planning to have something in, in May June timeframe. Um, more than likely, that will be virtual also this year. Um, we're working on the exact date and schedule for that now. Um, we didn't want to conflict with the uh, virtual public hearings for the six-year plan. So once we get those dates confirmed, we'll go ahead and confirm the date of our lap circle. And then uh, finally, I wanted to mention the, the uh, local programs workshop. 
there's a big workshop that, that's held in the, in the uh, fall. Um, it was canceled, of course, this year due to COVID. As of right now, there is a plan to hold one in person um, in October, you see 26th through 28th, and, and right now it's being planned for the city of Norfolk. So uh, more to come on that. Um, just wanted to share that and share those dates with you. Uh, Mr. Chair, I, I welcome any questions from the group. Thank you, Todd. We have uh, questions, comments from the floor. All right. It's uh, got to make it a little exciting to see an actual physical meeting shown on a, on a long term calendar. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Hope we're seeing everyone there. Moving on to uh, item eight, a three month schedule. We have meeting schedule for April, May, and June. Got some long range transportation uh, milestones at each of those, and then some discussions for CMAC, RSTP, and TA set aside for the uh, next round of funding. Uh, some regional connector, long range, and uh, HR TAC executive reports and meeting minutes in the for you information category. Do we have any old or new business for the good of the group? Uh, Mr. Chair, I do have a couple brief items. Sir. Uh, yes, we have a uh, TPS meeting uh, um, scheduled for next Friday, March 12 at 9.30. This uh, is uh, being moved up a little sooner than we would have had this meeting um, based on uh, the CMAC reconciliation, which you'll be hearing some more about uh, soon. Uh, so we plan to meet uh, next Friday and we'll be sending the agenda out uh, this Friday. Um, secondly, at the TTAC meeting last month, I announced the pending release of the notice of funding opportunity for the 2021 Infra Grant Program. Um, so the uh, re-release of this uh, NOFO uh, was uh, 18th of last month. The deadline is March 19, 11.59. Uh, Eastern uh, daylight time. So they're not giving us a whole lot of time, although it was delayed um, by over a month. Uh, so I, I did ask at the last meeting uh, if any localities uh, plan to submit an application for the 2021 infra. I did hear back from Virginia Beach so far. Uh, and if you do plan to submit, if you could please shoot me an email, hopefully by the close of business today, uh, if you do plan to uh, uh, submit any project or projects. Um, for the infra funding, please let me know. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mahaley. Uh, any other new old business from the floor? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Um, the uh, traffic subcommittee will be meeting uh, today at 1.30 virtually. Thank you, Carl. All right. Last call for all the new business. Mr. Chair, just to reiterate, the special meeting of the TPO board will be on March 29th, uh, I think 1030 to 12. So all the agenda and stuff will be out. But as Dale mentioned, that's an important action that the board will be taking. So just putting it on our radar. Yes, ma'am. Please, everyone work with your uh, representative to ensure that they are comfortable and happy with the, the list as shown or can put in questions so that TPO staff has a chance to prepare for those prior to the special meeting. Anything else to group? Everyone have a nice afternoon and enjoy the return of sunshine. We will see you in a month. Take care. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Uh,